Good morning and welcome to the Carrier Vitello Connection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be the facilitator for today's session. Today we have with us Dr. Barry Jacobs and he is going to be talking to us about embracing tender memories in caregiving. I'm really glad to see this topic today. Let me tell you just a little bit about Barry before he gets started. Barry Jacobs is a clinical psychologist, family therapist, and a principal in the Philadelphia Office of Health Management Associates. He is the co-author with his wife of the 2020 book, AARP, Love and Meaning After 50, The 10 Challenges to Great Relationships and How to Overcome Them. One of those challenges is spousal caregiving. He is also the co-author of AARP Meditations for Caregivers, Practical, Emotional, and Spiritual Support for You and Your Family, and the author of the Emotional Survival Guide for Caregivers, Looking After Yourself and Your Family While Helping an Aging Parent. Barry, welcome to the session today. Uh, thank you so much, Glenda, and uh, good morning to all of you. And I hope you're, you're faring well in the ice storm if, if, it's, uh, if, if you are in the midst of it. Uh, I, I'm up in Philadelphia. We we are accustomed to having ice storms here, and it's uh, it, they're not easy. I mean, a lot of a lot of wires come down, a lot of trees come down. Please please be careful. Um, so Glenda said a lot of nice things about me, but I'll I'll add uh, a, a couple, uh, one professional, one personal. Um, so one of the the real joys of my life professionally is I write a, a monthly column on the AARP website uh, <clears throat> for caregivers. And uh, a lot of what I present uh, for the for the well met care, care, caregiver teleconnections <clears throat> is based on on articles I've written, uh, and so so is this one today. Um, but but even more important than that is uh, my own uh, personal experience with caregiving. Um, that is, I I took care of my mom and my stepfather uh, for about seven years. <clears throat> they had uh, my stepfather had Alzheimer's disease, and my mom had vascular dementia. Uh, they they have both passed. My, my mom died about five and a half years ago. Um, but for all my professional experience, and I, I've been around for a while, um, it really was my my personal experience as a caregiver that has really uh, taught me the most uh, about caregiving. Um, and especially this topic today is one that I learned a lot uh, in in uh, in helping care for my mom. So um, as as uh, Glenda mentioned, uh, and, and as you may know from if you've attended any of my other uh, well-med uh, caregiver teleconnection uh, sessions, is that I, I, I love the interaction. I, you know, I'm going to ask you questions. I'd, I'd love to hear your 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 thoughts, your questions, um, either in the chat box or uh, by unmuting yourself, whichever is more comfortable for you. So let me, let me tell you what I have in mind for us. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what caregivers do and 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 how we do it. And what I mean by how we do it, I don't mean you know how how you uh, make a, you know how you help someone on and off a commode or how you you pick up you know how, how you fill a pillbox. I mean, what is your state of mind as you're doing it? How, you know what what how do you keep yourself going? Um, do you let yourself feel things or do you push feelings away? Um, and then in order to, to really develop um, a, a little a, a more emotional attunement to the people that we're caring for. Um, and, and so that uh, we, can, we can have what I call tender memories. How do we slow down and, and, and really uh, connect with, uh, with the folks that we're caring for in tender ways? Um, so I, I think you'll, you will probably have, a, have an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, but I'll, I'll also share some stories about uh, my uh, relationship with my mom uh, during the caregiving years. So let, let me start off with a question, and I don't think you're going to disagree with me about my first statement here, and that family caregivers are busy people with lots of things to do. So I'm wondering if you can put in the chat box uh, approximately how many different caregiving tasks you do a day, and if you could if you could name a few. And I. I I'm not sure. I have a feeling that um, many of the tasks can be familiar to all of us, but and I, and I recognize that every, not everybody does this on a daily basis. But approximately, how many how many do you do uh, in a day, a week, just to kind of give give us some sense of, of of how busy you are with caregiving? 
So I will look for uh, for your responses in the chat box. I'm not seeing anything yet. I'm sure you're 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 sitting there, you know, counting them on your fingers and trying to figure out uh, how many you're actually doing. So uh, Marlene says, Aaron's appointments, tax prep, meal prep, companionship. Uh, Myra says, too many to count. Uh, assistance with all ADLs, uh, cooking, med medication, dressing, medical appointments, dressing, etc. Et uh, other, other, others thoughts. Um, you know, how busy are you? What, what are all the different things that you're doing? Anybody want to unmute themselves and just kind of share it that way? Yes, Myra, go right ahead. Yeah, I was, I was, and you can see that I'm even doing typos as I'm even trying to type a response. It's just <laughs> everything because you do become, and it changes from day to day. You kind of you you step in wherever their brain can't function anymore. So I basically do feel like I am the remote control or the puppeteer that is assisting this person through everything. Uh, my mom is at the point that she needs help with everything. And if she's able to put on her socks on her own, you kind of have to supervise her so that when she bends over to put them, she doesn't, you know, fall over. Um, that's just the reality of it. You know, it starts with, as we all know, them needing some help, but then they offer resistance. So it's how do you help them while they're offering the resistance and they're telling you that's nothing. And then from there, then on, it continues to progress and it's more and more each day. Um, I think that would, that's very well said. Uh, let me just make sure I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly. Is it Mayra or Myra? Myra, you got it correct. Got it. Thank you, Myra. So um, you, you're really describing uh, what the what the life of a, of a dementia caregiver is. And I, I can I can certainly relate. And, I you know, you mentioned remote control. Well, I can tell you one of the things that I did almost on a daily basis for my mom, particularly in the early stages of her dementia, is I would fix the remote control because she invariably would either lose it or 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 push the wrong buttons and the TV would be all messed up and I would I, you know and she wanted to watch TV and it meant that I had a had to figure out what she'd done and and that was that could be uh, quite uh, annoying um, but it was certainly one of the activities that I did on a daily basis and what I heard you say Myra is is that uh, caregivers uh, particularly of an individual with dementia. Uh, sometimes they don't know what the day is going to bring. They, they may know certain things like taking care of activities of daily living, getting someone out of bed, getting them dressed, getting them fed, combing their hair and, and all those good things. But um, lots of other things come up in, in, in the meantime. And sometimes you're doing things for, for folks and sometimes you're just supervising them, over, overseeing them and making sure that they're, they're not uh, making mistakes that are going to get them in trouble in some way. So thank you. I appreciate those of you who, who, uh, who shared. Lori said organizing meds and reminders. And I, I think those are, uh, uh, I certainly did a lot of that too. My mom, my mom, I will tell you, hated uh, the fact that I took over her pill box at one point, but she just was not safe with her pills. And um, she did not want to be reminded. It just was a reminder to her that, that her thinking skills weren't what they were. And uh, she resented me for reminding her. So uh, not, not, not an easy situation for caregivers. Okay. I have a question. Please go ahead, Renee. Okay, what if you, okay, I have, I, I'm a caregiver with a 95 year old that I'm with her five days a week. Stop as a whip, but what do you do when others try to make it seem as if she has dementia? They move stuff out of the house. Um, they don't give her, you know, me, when I'm with her, I, uh, give her the space to do as much uh, as she can. And I uh, assist her whenever it's necessary. But most of the time, she do it on her own. But her son wants her wants, wants to put it as if she has dementia. How do you handle, you know, because it's, it's beginning to be very tedious. Uh, so this is a uh, another very uh, complicated topic. It's not really the focus of what we're talking about today. But what I'll what I'll say to you, just kind of give you a short answer, is um, I I think you provide the son with uh, maybe you know daily reports. I don't know if you write in a, in a journal, a log for him to read, or you, you 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 speak with him, but just to let him know all the things that his mother still can do and and what she's been doing. You know, every day she did this, she did that. 
uh, the more evidence you provide for him of her capabilities that, that you know that these are things that she's doing on her own not things that you have to do for her maybe it'll give him pause to think about his mom uh, as, as being more impaired than she is i mean that's the hope anyway um but okay. i okay i think just just keep i mean you're you know you can't you you can't um say to him uh you know i think you're out of line with the way you're taking over your mom's life that usually won't doesn't go too well but just continue to provide him with information about what what his, his mom in fact can do um i see a comment here uh and this is from this is from uh ann and she says i live with my mother and have been taking care of her for 10 years in the last few years it has consumed my life she's 102 years old and is completely dependent Ooh. on me I take care of uh, all her physical needs, dressing, bathroom, and fixing her meals. I run the house we live in, all her financials, her medications, her medical medical care, and her companion. She went on hospice about six months ago. Mentally, she is sometimes forgetful, but most of the time she is with it mentally. This has been quite a journey for us. I'm her daughter and oldest child. I really have no backup as both my siblings work full time and are out of town. While this has been extremely hard, it also has been a gift as we have gotten to know each other as adults. Um, and that is what you've written. Um, uh, first of all, thank you so much for sharing. And but you've written a beautiful um, uh, description of, of the journey that you and your mom have been on together. And it sounds like there that certainly part of the journey, as you say, has been a gift uh, that that I'm sure every day working as hard as you're working on her behalf uh, can sometimes be tiring and maybe even times irritating. But it sounds like this also been uh, increased contact with your mom and getting to know her in a different way. And that, that's really what we're going to be talking about today. So thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, let, let me go on. Um, so, so here is what I'm, I'm going to I'd like to, to focus on mostly today. And that is while you do while you're in the midst of doing caregiving tasks, while you're in the midst of helping someone get dressed, getting them out of bed. Uh, have them putting their medicines in the pill box, making them lunch, all the different caregiving tasks. What is, do you ever kind of stop and, and, and sort of check in with yourself? Say, where am I? And what is my frame of mind? Am I being present? Am I doing, you know, am I really kind of being there in that moment? Or am I letting, am I, am I on kind of an automatic pilot? I, I can do all these things probably without thinking very much because I've done them so many times. And I don't really want to be, be present because being present um, is very draining for me. So I try to kind of go on automatic pilots and not think too much and not feel too much. So what, what you know, I, and, I'll, and I'll just speak personally. When, you know, when I would be doing things for my mom, I, I sometimes in order to kind of just keep myself going, I, I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would sort of do what needed to be done. It was sort of like, you know, checking things off a list but I wasn't really present with her. I wasn't there with her doing these things. Does that make sense to folks? And anybody have any any thoughts about that that they they'd like to share? Glenda, I'd be I'd welcome your viewpoint as well on this. Well, I had told Barry before you were all on that. My, well, a few of you were on that. My sister-in-law had a conversation about this since I knew what the topic was coming up, and that's just what she had said, Barry. She felt guilty, and that comes in a lot with caregivers, I know, because she was so busy doing the tasks that she needed to get done and directing her mother to do those that she forgot about being present, listening. Um, and as you put on the slide, she was almost like on autopilot. So I think people can really relate to that. I, I imagine they can. Uh, Myra says it's hard when you're exhausted and juggling so many things at a time. It is hard, Myra. It is, you know, sometimes there's something to be said about having habits that you don't have to think too much about, right? Like, you know, get, you know, we don't think much about brushing our teeth because we just brush our teeth. We don't think much about um, maybe uh, making lunch. We've, we've done it, you know, 10,000 times. Um, and especially when you're tired, when you don't, you don't want to pay so much attention to everything. You just want to sort of do it and get it done. And like get get through the, that long list of tasks you have every day, then it's very easy to go on automatic pilot. So here's here's what I'd like to share. And I see one other comment before we go on. 
Uh, and, and Myra says, however, I do reflect from time to time how I can improve on a challenging task. And I think that's great. I mean, I it sounds to me like you're, you're committed to doing the very best job you can and not simply getting getting the tasks done. And, and so you're, you're, you're thinking about your performance and, it, and I think that's great. Um, all right, so what, what I'd like to suggest is that while we're in the midst of doing caregiving tasks, our frame of mind can have, what it, depending on what it is, can have different effects. So, you know, I think we, we, we have a long list of things to do um, and we want to get them done in uh, within a certain time frame. Um, for instance, you know, I'm taking my mom to the, the doctor's office this afternoon and I, before she goes to the doctor's office, there's a whole long list of things we need to do. I need to kind of get her out of bed. I need to get her dressed. I need to get her get her um, uh, fed. I need to uh, make sure that the uh, you know that the we're we're leaving in enough time so that we hit traffic. We won't be late for the appointment. Um, I need to figure out a way to you know go to the valet parking so that my mom doesn't have to walk too far. Or I, either that, or I need to get a wheelchair to, to you know. So there's a, there's all these different things I'm thinking about as you know in order to 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 get her to the doctor's office and have a have her checkup and i'm i'm trying to go through them as quickly as i can and i'm i'm and i'm trying so in my when my frame of mind is thinking about the tasks and, and then you know i'm thinking about uh, it may have an impact on the, on the timing and efficiency if if i go if i just am able to kind of do it all kind of turn off my emotions and do what needs to be done then maybe in fact I'm going to be more efficient, or at least I think I'm going to be more efficient. Um, so, but what happens is when we sort of turn off our emotions in 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 order to be more efficient, I think ultimately it has an impact on our emotions, and it has an effect on the care receiver's emotions. So um, when you're caring for somebody, and it feels like you're doing things to them or you know rather than doing things with them it, it the, the person who's receiving that care has a different feeling if they feel like you're with them i think they feel more connected to you if they feel like you're just kind of rushing about just checking things off a box and that all they are is a source of chores for you mm -hmm. it makes them feel a different way it often makes them feel like a burden yeah sure. so I'm hoping that makes sense. Before I go on, does that make sense? I'm happy to to, to talk about it a little bit more. Doris, did you have a question or comment? Okay, maybe her mic is unmuted by accident. Okay, um, I'll give you one more example. Um, if, uh, uh, if it was the end of the day, um, and I had worked my job and I was, I, I was tired. And then I was coming, uh, particularly early on, my mom lived in her own apartment about a mile from my house. And I'd swing by her house on the way home. And, and then I knew in my mind, all right, before I can get home to my house to be with my wife and, and teenage children and to have my dinner, then there were certain things I needed to do for my mom. And so I'd kind of rush into her apartment. I'd kind of Kind of busy myself getting dinner on the table for her um but i wouldn't really relate to her very much so uh let's let me see joanne says caregivers i work with so often have to be the bad guy by taking away keys maybe to his moving maybe moving to assisted living bringing in helpers they fire take, taking over finances they are overwhelmed and say i'm at the end of the rope sometimes what if the emotions are anger resentment guilt and frustration and um, so what I would say to you, Joanne, is the emotions that you list here, anger, resentment, guilt, and frustration, are some of the emotions of caregiving. Those are normal emotions that caregivers feel. It's also hopefully normal that they feel, in addition to these, they feel positive emotions, like Anne was, was saying, that there, there may be moments of, of connection that happens in caregiving that might not have happened unless caregiving had occurred. But I think the question here is, what do we do with all these negative emotions? If we let ourselves kind of stew in them, 
then then we're not or, or does it does it make it difficult for us to actually get things done so that's the question so let me let me move to the sec next slide and, and talk about that specifically um so many caregivers whoops let me go back many caregivers turn off their emotions they turn off that resentment and that anger and that frustration and they do it by almost becoming like a robot they just got to do what they need to do they don't want to get emotional because if they do so they're afraid that it's going to going to undermine their, their their caregiving task they won't be able to focus on getting things done they won't be able to be efficient and because to feel those things like resentment and anger often makes people feel guilty so they don't want to feel those things right so it's easier for the caregiver from a logistical standpoint to sort of turn off the emotions but it may be easier than from from an emotional standpoint to turn off the emotions and just sort of become a doer do what needs to be done does it joanne does that make sense yes that does and uh you know how do you control those and and then is just becoming a doer recommended um so the second answer is easier than the first, right? So the second answer is, I don't think we just become a doer because I think something gets, something important gets lost in the process. If all we're doing is doing, right? If, if all we're doing with our, the, the, whether it be a parent, whether it be a spouse that we're committed to caring for is we're treating them like a list of chores that have to get done then our relationship with them suffers. We don't want to be overwhelmed by our emotions. So your first question is harder. But, it, but before I get to that question, and I see another comment here, um, can we be emotionally present and still be efficient? Can we get done what needs to get done and also be someone who's who can be emotionally connected to the people we're, we're we're providing care for. You know, if we want to kind of get fancy here, we might we may say, can we can we both do and be? Can we can we can we be there with our loved one and do for them, or do we have to just focus on doing to get things done and also to shut off to, to make sure that we aren't too too upset all the time. So I did see a comment here from Diane who says, blocking my frustration right now, I guess what I'm saying is frustrating you. And you don't have to block it, Diane. I just got on this. I was on the phone scheduling a doctor's appointment for my dad who fell recently and now needs to see someone. And yes, I can understand how frustrating that is. And falls are very, very scary. Um, so let, let me say uh, in answer to the question that you raised, Joanne, is I think that we're trying to find a balance. We don't want to cut off our emotions so much that we we cut ourselves, we essentially cut ourselves off emotionally from the person we're caring for. But we also don't want to kind of sit and stew in those emotions to such an extent that we make it impossible for us to be to, to, to provide the care that we know our loved one needs. And so that balance is, is hard. Um, and Diane, if you want to unmute and, you know, talk more about kind of how you handle your emotions and whether it's better to block them, you know, by all means, please do, uh, because this is a conversation today and I'm, I'm, I'm sharing my ideas and my ideas are my ideas. I mean, you may have very, a very different way of approaching this. Yeah, thanks. Um, let's see, I'll put the video on too. Great. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, I just struggle with this in general uh, because I'm taking care of my mom and my dad. My dad's in memory care and my mom, you know, is at home, but she needs her own support. And um, every day I'm just overwhelmed with, you know, caregiving. And then on top of it, I'm trying to run a business and a household and, you know, all that stuff. So it's really hard. And he fell, you know, he has Parkinson's, so he he gets obsessed with a delusion and then he wants to get up and he has trouble getting up. 
And so anyway, now we have a full-time caregiver in the memory care. And so all of this is just very, and he went to the hospital because he fell. So anyway, all of this is just very stressful for me and my mom, and then stressful because my mom is stressed. And then we're wondering if he'll ever stop getting up and falling. And, you know, it's just, and then if I let myself really think about the situation that he's in and, you know, how sad it is and, you know, all that. I mean, I don't even really think about that. I'm just kind of just so overwhelmed in my life, you know. Diane, it sounds like you're doing an enormous amount and your parents are very lucky to have you. And I, I mean that seriously. So I guess the question is, is there a way to kind of kind of put your game face on and do what needs to be done? And but believe me, I know what it means to put a game face on and just kind of walk straight ahead and, and do, but also to find a way to, to create moments with your mom and perhaps also with your dad where you're going to just be with them. That mm -hmm. the, doing, the doing isn't isn't the focus of your interaction with them. Yeah, and I'm trying. It's really hard with my dad, but um, I have a caregiver for my mom twice a week, and I have one today, for example, so that's making it easier for me to do this. <laughs> um, and when I have that, then I feel like I can get more moments with her where it's just us enjoying things, you know? And, and that's wonderful. And so what, what you're basically saying is, sure, you can have those moments if you have the right support, because there has mm -hmm. to be a framework of support for it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's not, it's really not, it's not going to happen because there's just too many other things you have to attend to. And too under, many the right, under the right conditions, it sounds like you're trying to find ways of having time with your mom that feel good. That, that, yeah. that are, that, as you say, you, you enjoy, the two of you enjoy your com the company, not just getting through the day getting everything done and needs to get done yeah and with her i'm just trying to make sure she doesn't fall and make sure she doesn't do all these things and so i feel like i'm just doing all these things with her rather than enjoying her uh and i hear you and i it, what what a difficult balance it is to strike i mean now i'm going to i mean i i'm going to bring up my mom again because i think you know you're being you're sharing a lot about yourself and I, I, I might as well, I mean, I, I feel like I, I should share some of, of my, you know, for, for me, my mom was at fault risk. She fell constantly. There were times where I would come into her apartment and she had been on the, on the carpet for hours mm -hmm. and it would scare the heck out of me, you know, and I, I, you know, I tried to, to provide as much support for her as I could with AIDS there as many hours as we could afford. Um, but it, what happened after a while is, you know, if, if my focus with her was all about safety all the time, then I never could really relax with her and just talk with her and hang out with her. Mm -hmm. Things like watch TV with her or or talk, you know, have her tell me stories of, her, or, you know, when she grew up and the things that happened, um, which are things that I did enjoy. But that wasn't, there wasn't enough time for that oftentimes. It was too many things that had to get, get, uh, get done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that Makes make sense? sense? Oh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So we, let's let's talk. Th and thank you, Diane, for sharing. But let, let's talk some more about. So how do we find this this balance that's supposed to be, um, you know, this magical balance? All right. So what Diane just described, I think, is what's here on at least the first line, and that is, you you know, you step out of the caregiving routine. The caregiving routine, like any routine, is something that you've done many times and you, you, you don't have to think about it. And so you don't, and you certainly don't want to feel about it. You just want to sort of do it and get it done. But there, but to make times where you step out of that and you focus on being present is very important because that's the way you develop the moments which I'm going to call tender memories. And let me let me just go to the next slide and I'll come back to this one. So there's something that I have found helpful for myself. And then when I've shared this with other people, it sometimes is helpful for them. And you know, it's got this fancy name that I made up called perspective retrospection. But I want you to imagine, you know, it's five years from now. So it's it's 2028. And, you know, unfortunately, 
the person you're caring for is now uh, is now deceased and your caregiving is over and you're looking back to, to January 31st, 2023 and, and thinking about your time as a caregiver. And, and if you imagine yourself in 2028, looking back at this time to ask yourself some questions, what do you think is gonna stand out to you about this time? What do you think there is about this time, this, this, these caregiving years that you're gonna cherish? And what do you think you're gonna regret? So, you know, if anyone is an old Bruce Springsteen fan, um, I think it was Thunder Road that, where he has a line, someday we'll look back on this and it will all seem funny. Maybe not so much with caregiving. I don't think his caregiving is going to seem funny. Maybe there are parts of it that are on some days that are funny. Um, there's also a Beatles song, um, and I'm forgetting the the, uh, the the name of it now. And I'm not gonna I am not gonna try singing it for you. Um, <laughs> but it, it basically is it's you know it's it's this idea that the things that one day we're going to look back on the th the things we said said today. Um, I think that's the name of the song, um, the things we said today. Uh, and looking back on, on the things that we say, the moments that we create with one another in order to, that how, how will we think about these things in the future? So part of, part of why I've been thinking about this a lot is, you know, I mentioned right at the top of, of, of the presentation that it's now five and a half years since my mom died, right? I, I think back on the seven years I provided care for her and my stepfather. Um, and I think really, did I, did I do everything I should have done? Did I, did I, um, and, and maybe even a more important question is that was I as present as I should have been? You know, I could have, I could say, yes, I made sure my mom was safe. I made sure she was well fed. I got her all the best medical care. I made sure that her medic prescription, you know, her medic medication box was filled correctly. Um, I did all the tasks that I was supposed to do as her oldest son. But was I as present with her? Did I connect with her as as, as well as much as I might have? Did I create uh, memories of tenderness with her that after she's gone, I can cherish? So that's the that's the perspective that I'm where I am today, and, I'm, and even in your as you are in the midst of caregiving perspective, I'm suggesting that maybe you 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 try to assume. And so to go back, uh, oops, I'm sorry, to go back to this slide for a second. How how do we make ourselves present, and make ourselves present without getting emotionally overwhelmed? How do we create memories that five years from now we are going to cherish? You know, how do we have, um, how do we use the time available to us to connect? Because the day will come when there won't be that possibility of connecting anymore. So, stepping out of the caregiving routine entirely as Diane mentioned, is one way of doing this. Another is I'm a big fan of, of all kinds of mindfulness exercises. And I'm sure most of you are, have some familiarity with mindfulness, but for those of you who don't, it's basically, uh, these are exercises that, that derive uh, from meditation, but they're not, you know, they're not meditation. These are just, these are just exercises to help people become more aware of their surroundings. And rather than go through life on automatic pilot, to go through life fully aware of everything that's going on around us and also inside of us to be as present as possible. And then in addition to that, to also be, to not react so strongly to what we are being present to. That's what mindfulness is about. So the 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 uh, the goal is non-reactive awareness, 
And the simplest mindfulness exercise that I know is one that I imagine a number of you are already familiar with is called the five senses. Um, is there anybody who who has done five five senses? It takes about mm, forty five seconds to do, but it does make people more present. Has anybody has anybody here ever tried this before? Okay, I'm going to take that as a no, and I'm going to um, to you know I'm going to walk you through it just to kind of give you a sense of what it would mean. To, to, to be more present in this given moment. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to do a few things. <clears throat> so I'd like you to imagine, well, actually that that was perspective retrospective. We're not doing any imagining here. We're gonna actually do this. So I'd like you to, to, to just notice five things that you can see right now. So, Certainly you're looking at your computer screen and you see me, but maybe you notice your coffee cup next to the computer. Maybe you're set up near a window and you can look out the window and perhaps there's um, a stack of papers nearby. Perhaps there's um, a, a, a painting on the wall. But just to take a moment to bring yourself into the present and just notice those five things that you can see right now. And now I'd like you to shift your attention uh, to four things that you can hear. So you can hear the sound of, of my voice. Or perhaps you can hear traffic outside. Perhaps there's a, a television playing in another room. Perhaps the window's open and you can hear the wind. Maybe there is some, you're living in, a, in an apartment where you hear your neighbor's footsteps up above you. But just focus for a moment on those four things that you can hear. And now I'd like you to shift your attention the three things that you can touch. Maybe you can feel your feet resting on the ground as you're sitting in a chair. Maybe you can feel uh, the, the, uh, the collar of your shirt against your neck. Maybe you can feel the wind blowing, the air blowing from a, from a heater or from a vent somewhere in the house. But just focus for a moment on those three things that you can feel, you can touch. And now I'd like you to focus on two things you can taste. Perhaps you can still taste that morning coffee or maybe that egg sandwich you had. Or maybe you've been eating candy this morning, who knows? But can you still bring your attention to, to what you can taste in your mouth right now? And then finally, I'd like you to shift your attention to whatever you can smell. Can you smell that coffee? Can you smell last night's dinner? Are you wearing perfume today? Are there flowers in the room? So that's the five senses. Would anybody like to share what, what that was like to, to just walk through that small exercise. Sometimes I'm accused of putting everybody to sleep. Maybe that's happened. Yeah. Glenda, what was it like for you? 
Well, I just, yeah, somebody else said the same thing I did. It was just very calming, very serene when I took the focus off of everything that was going around me and, and on one thing at a time, it just really, I guess, brought me to the present. Okay. Thank you, Glenda. And I see Lori put in the same comment, very common. Any other thoughts about this? As I walked you through the five senses, were you able to keep your, your focus on the present? Or were you thinking about what you have to do, what's for lunch, or thinking about what happened last night, or waiting for the doctor to call? Okay, Myra says yes in the present, thank you. And Diane says yes, was in present. Okay, so this is a very simple exercise that when you're very, very busy and you're rushing around, when you've got a, a head full of worries about what needs to be done, to take a few minutes to just walk yourself through your five senses. What is it I'm seeing at the moment? What am I hearing? What am I, what am I touching? What am I tasting and what am I smelling? Just to bring yourself right into the present. So imagine you're with the person for whom you've made a commitment to provide care. If your state of mind is, we've got to get things done, I've got to get her cleaned up and ready to go to the doctor's appointment. Let me get her socks on, let me get her pants on. Where's a nice blouse that she likes? Then, then you're very much doing things to the person who's receiving care. When you're as present as possible, when you're, you're, you're seeing them, you're hearing them, maybe you're touching them, maybe you are smelling them. I don't think you're gonna be tasting them, right? It brings you into a, a, a kind of contact with them that you and have a connection with them that you don't have if you're focused on let's just push through. Does that make sense? there's no response, I either think that what I'm saying makes perfect sense, and I, maybe I, I put a positive spin on it, like, great, everyone is with me. Or I think, hmm, maybe I'm talking a different language today. All right, Lori and Myra are there to reassure, reassure, reassure <laughs> me, and Diane too. Yeah. Thank you, Diane, I'm so calm right now, I didn't respond. The idea isn't to, you know, to make you so calm that you you you're you know you fall into into sleep. That's, that's not what the idea is. The idea is to is to be present. So how how do we find ways of using this simple exercise or other ways of being present with the people we're caring for who may not be here tomorrow? So that, as I mentioned on this slide, when we're looking back five years from now, it's not with regrets. You know, when I think about my time, those seven years with my mom, I don't think about all the things that I did, you know, all the times I, I took her to the doctor, all the times we wound up in the emergency room. You know, all the times I fed her a meal. Because that's not what's really important in my relationship with my mom. And I don't think it's probably what's important in your relationship with the person you're caring for. What's important is, what was it like to be with them? What was the sound of their voice like? What was what were stories that they still could tell, pictures that they still could 
could see and, and remember what, what went on in the, those old photographs. How do we create more of those moments? Because I promise you, it's those moments that are going to matter to you five years from now. So let me ask you, what are ways that you slow down? What are ways that you kind of step out of the caregiving role to be with the people you're caring for and not doing for them? And I'll ask two other questions. What tender memories have you already created in your caregiving, which will be meaningful to you later? And what tender memories would you like to make that maybe you've been so busy you haven't had the chance to make them? And I'm going to... Um, just kind of open it up for anybody who wants to share anything. Uh, Nina, did you have something you wanted to share with us? Yes, I was going to say that um, I am in that space a lot. I'm so busy doing things and um, that, that I do forget to slow down. It's for my husband. He has Parkinson's for many years. But one thing I found that... Um, that kind of addresses this and it makes us feel both um, better, I think, is he sleeps a lot during the day. And, and when he's not sleeping, he's very, very fatigued and tired. So he's in bed a lot. Um, I stop everything I, I'm doing sometimes. And I lay down in the bed with him and we hold hands. And I, I know that he likes it and we can talk sometimes if he's still awake. And I like it too, because it's very calming. It, it kind of, I feel my shoulders going down and um, it, it's just really helpful for both of us. And I feel like at that point, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. And we don't do it a lot because I'm very busy, but um, you know, maybe three times a week or something like that. Nina, that's fantastic. And, and I, you know, interestingly, I, I have a, a a client, psychotherapy client who um, is caring for her husband with the ALS. And she also is constantly busy and was very irritated with him because she has to do everything for him. Right? He can't, he literally cannot move his hands. He can't do anything. And, um, but one of the things that, that they are now doing is they, they get it. She gets in bed with him and they just touch and they, and as you say, they talk. And it makes her feel connected to him in a way that when she's doing tasks for him, she does not feel connected. And it makes him feel better because it makes him feel like a person and not just a kind of sack of potatoes and he's, he's lugging around. Um, so thank you. I mean, I, I thought, I, you know, what you said Nina, really resonates. Um, Myra says, I need to make time to look at old photos with my mom. I also want to start a photo album of her best pictures and memory to remember her uh, as she, uh, to remember what, you know, as she is gone. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite following that sentence, but I think we know what you mean. We do spend quality time watching TV and cuddling with my cat. I started using music to wake her up um, and just say, remember the way she was. Yes, Th thank you. So it sounds like, Myra, despite all the things, the many things you have to do, you're taking the time to find ways of creating other kinds of moments. Um, I found with my mom that if I can open the photo album, that it made makes a, a big difference to remind her of who she had been, where she had gone, um, especially if there are places and things that we did together. Diane says, we have fun watching The Bachelor. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I, I, I might not enjoy that so much, but, you know, you guys sounds like it's great for you. What, what are other ways people slow down and create tender memories with the people they care for? Or are there other ways that people would like to do this that, that maybe they just haven't gotten around to doing? Uh, Nina again. 
Go ahead, Nina. Yeah, I just, uh, I'm not sure this is exactly on topic, but one of the um, challenges that I found in slowing down and um, listening, really listening to what he's saying instead of doing my chores and making sure, you know, everything's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, one of the problems is, I'm sure like a lot of people um, who are um, in illness, he has a lot of pain. So a lot of, if I really stop and listen to him, a lot of it is about this hurts, that hurts, and it's terrible pain. And it, the reason it's hard to do that, to really focus on him like that is it's, it's very hard. It's very sad. It's very painful. I'd rather, you know, sometimes you just want to do your chores so you don't have to go to that place where it hurts emotionally for yourself. It's easier not to think about it. Uh, Nina, you are, I think, expressing what everybody feels. And you're expressing it very well. It is easier at times to just get things done. You know, it's easier for lots of reasons. Um, but it sounds like even, even so, you know, even, even when you don't want to feel your husband's suffering, there's still times when you'll let yourself be close to him emotionally because it matters. It matters to you. It matters to him. So you, that sounds like you have found that balance that we're talking about today of creating moments that, that are going to matter to you later on, but also not subjecting yourself so much to the pain all the time that you can't, you're, it debilitates you. You can't get anything done. Um, Donna, did you want to say something? Yeah, you're on mute, Donna. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah, I think when I was helping my mom, um, one of the things I would just try to find the humor in the moment. So, if kind of like the humor and the tragedy. Um, so, um, not all the time, but just sometimes just to refocus us on, okay, this is our life now. And sometimes it's like, for instance, when she was losing control of her finances, um, I was helping her and I happened to have her wallet and there was just this stack of like 100 $1 bills. <laughs> so I looked at her and we happened to be in her kitchen and there's a supporting beam in her kitchen. So I looked at her, I looked at the pole, I looked at her, I was like, mama, what have you and Angie been doing, you know? And uh, just to get her mind off of, I'm losing control of my finances. And, you know, we just both had a really good laugh. And, um, you know, of course, you know, and I was just like, you know, what guys have been over here and, you know, just kind of made a big deal out of it laughing. And like, I think I need to move in with you. And um, like, kind of like treating her like the teenager and me being the mom. You know? So we just, I just tried to find some of those moments to just try to break that tension, but yet also acknowledge that, okay, we have a problem, but it's not the end of the world, you know? And um, just to try to help um, get through it that way, keep the humor in it. And that's a memory I think I will always have, you know? Donna, that's great. And humor is a wonderful way of, bringing, of being with somebody in the present. You know, we, we, you're sharing a yeah. joke together. You're not laughing at them, you're laughing with them. And yeah. it, it, may, it makes the whole thing, you know, that harder, you know, it makes a hard situation easier to take when you can find the funny side of it. So, so thank yeah. you for sharing. Uh, Julia has a, a comment. Uh, she writes, I'm Julia. I started journaling, taking care of my mom. She transitioned after a year of total care and I live off memories, uh, especially Judge Judy, uh, which she loved. Uh, this class was very helpful and soothing for me. I'm going to use the exercises to slow down because now I'm caring for two other Older family, elderly family members in their homes, and I would say, Julia, you sound like you're um, you are um, a, a real source of strength for your family, and you are. Uh, and I think journaling is a wonderful way of, of of having us bring our attention into the present and really reflecting on what's going on. I too kept a journal um, uh, of my years with my mom. I didn't write it in it every day. I just wrote, wrote in it when I when I sort of moved to write in it, and it and it, but it. The writing of the writing about what happened kind of made me reflect on those things more. And now, years later, it it it, it helps me remember some of the good moments, and not just bad moments. Um, 
so I, I you know, thank you, thank you as well for, for sharing, Julia. Um, I'm gonna. We have just a couple minutes left. I'm gonna stop sharing and just see if anybody else has any questions on any topic that they would like to 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 bring up. You know, with the, that, not any topic. Obviously, we're not gonna. But it, um, anything about being present with our loved ones, trying to connect with them while with the time that we have with them. Any other thoughts about that? So, so here is here is my question for you, and you can be frank, right? Because I'm 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 you know I'm, I'm pretty pretty frank guy. Um, does, is is what I'm sharing with you today? Does it make sense, and does it feel right, or does it feel like no, I'm not going there? You know, I'm not. I don't don't make me you know start feeling more things because I have to be present and feel feel my loved ones suffering more. I don't I don't want to suffer. I have to just get through this and I'm and the suffering isn't for me. What what are your what are your thoughts? Can I share on Lori? Yeah. yeah. Hi. Thanks so much. Um, this has been really helpful. I'm on the early end of this journey. Um, my husband was recently diagnosed with um, you know, a, a progressive neurological disorder and um, a very brilliant man who's losing his um, memory. And um, most of our family members are not aware of this yet because we've just started wrapping our heads around it. And um, I'm working hard to kind of protect him and maintain his dignity um, in the eyes of the people that we know. But on the other hand, um, I do need their support. Our loved ones, I think, need to understand and know what we're dealing with here and that might give them opportunities to be of service, emotional service to me, um, that I just haven't found a way to, other than my daughter and my very closest, closest relatives and closest friends, this isn't really widely known. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm just saying just, do you have any thoughts on how to introduce this kind of stuff to people who may not see him as often or um so Lori, i'm going to um i'm you know we're at the top of the hour and, and yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to give you a very short short answer to a very complicated question and that is um i know you want to protect your husband and you want to protect his dignity but i would i would share i, I would i would develop a shorthand way of explaining what's going on with him and what you're what you're going through, and I also would tell people in, in very specific terms if they want to be of help, this is what they can do to be of help. Okay. Because most people mean well, but a lot of times people don't know what to do, and they also don't want to intrude. Yeah. If you say to them, "I could, you know, I could use this from you. Take yeah. me, take me out to lunch once a month, right?" Or stop by on Sunday mornings uh, and you know once 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 every couple of months and, and and bring breakfast for us. I mean yeah give people a specific task to do it will make everyone else more comfortable. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, sorry to go over a little bit Glenda, but I think uh, you know, not a problem. Yeah. It's an important topic and um well I'm so grateful for all the sharing that you did. I know Barry is too because it came, became more like a conversation and that's how we like it uh, when Barry is our presenter. Um I want to hope that you Lori, especially you, you kind of touched me with what you shared um since you're new into this. Please come back and join us again on future sessions. That I feel that it will be helpful to you and you will learn how to navigate this very difficult process that you're going through. Uh, for all of the rest of you, I wish you a wonderful day. Uh, look at the Caregiver Teleconnection um, calendar. It is out for February. We have a lot of really good sessions that are coming up. And I certainly hope to see you very, very soon. And you too, Barry, see you next time we're together. Thank and you so much for your help, Glenda. Yeah, go Eagles. <laughs> Here we go. I'll put on my Eagles hat. That's my cue. Here comes I'm waiting the hat. The end. He's got his Philadelphia Eagles hat on, so I wish them well, as well as the Kansas City Chiefs, which are my team. We can we can be together on this. All right. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you real soon. Bye bye. Take care.